Okay, so this is one of the best papers ever in philosophy, uh, mainly because it's so short. It does all it needs to do in as few pages as possible, gets in, gets out, it's done. Uh, and at the same time, it was pretty earth-shaking. Uh, and it's how this guy, Edmund Gettier, made his name, uh, which is now remembered in Gettier cases and the Gettier problem uh, for epistemology. So this is an issue in, again, epistemology, which is the area of philosophy uh, to do with uh, whether or not we know something, what, uh, what we're justified in believing, that kind of thing. So there, at the time, Gettier writes this article in the 60s, early 60s. And you, you can kind of tell it's from the early 60s because all, uh, in the mid-century, all philosophy articles involved men with short Anglo-Saxon names. Smith, Jones, Brown, Black, all of these things. Uh, they're all men, they've all got these short English sounding names. Um, so it's, it's kind of distinctive of the era. Everybody's Smith and Jones. Anyway, uh, at the time he's writing, as he says, he cites uh, a couple of people, for example, Roderick Chisholm, a very well-known um, philosopher of the time, and A.J. Ayer, of course, very well known um, for writing Language, Truth, and Logic. They both have versions of this account, which is sort of generally accepted. Uh, for it to be said that a person knows that P, where P is a proposition, a claim, these, each of these conditions is individually necessary. That is, if it's not true, then you don't know it. Um, and, but also jointly sufficient. That is, if each of these three is met, then uh, that person does know that P. So first of all, obviously, you've got to believe it. You can't know something unless you believe it. Uh, so knowledge, like belief, is a kind of mental state. It's a cognitive state that you're in. Uh, but it's different from belief because you can believe any old shit, and people do, as we know to our cost. You can believe uh, anything pretty much that you want. Now, that, that's not entirely true. You can, uh, people argue you can't literally believe two uh, contradictory things. Um, you could get into that. Can you believe uh, both P and not P at the same time? Well, uh, that's a discussion. But certainly you can believe false things. Uh, so one clear difference between believing and knowledge is that you can only know something if that thing is true. So if it turns out you can say, I know he's the killer. If it turns out he's not the killer, well then you didn't know it. You just believed it. So this is sort of an external um, criterion of knowledge that, that makes it different from beliefs. Belief seems to be, whether or not you believe something seems to be just about things happening in your head. But whether or not you know something seems to involve things outside your head, at, that is, whether or not uh, the thing that you think you know is true. So you can think you know something and not actually know it, whereas, of course, that doesn't seem to be true of belief. Um, so th those are two clear conditions. Knowledge is a form of belief, but it's uh, specifically believing things that are true. But Obviously, those two conditions are not sufficient in themselves because, you know, imagine you toss a coin um, and say heads or tails, and I convince myself that it's heads. And it turns out I was right. So I believed that it was heads, and it turns out it was heads. Did I know that it was heads? No, it doesn't seem that I knew that. So the missing element is uh, that I was justified in some loose understanding of uh, justified in believing that. Well, now, so the work that was done in epistemology concerning knowing that, because there's, there's different areas of, of epistemology, um, but in the, in the study of knowledge that, which is different from knowing how, right? Knowing how to ride a bike is different from knowing that bikes exist or something like that. But if we're talking about knowing that, 
the work that was being done is how do we make sense of this? What is the correct account of justification? And then along comes Gettier and says, well, actually, you can meet all three conditions but not know something. So he doesn't question that each of these is necessary. What he questions is that they're jointly sufficient, that if all three are satisfied, that you know something. And he gives a couple of cases involving Smith and Jones. So in the first case, Smith believes, uh, so in this case P, the thing being uh, believed, is the man who will get the job has 10 coins in his pocket. Now, um, he believes it, and it turns out it's true. The man who gets the job has 10 coins in his pocket. So these two are met. Now, was he justified in believing that P? Yes, because um, it was almost certain that Jones would get the job and Jones had 10 coins in his pocket. Now, of course, the catch is the person who actually gets the job is Smith himself, and what Smith didn't know is that he had 10 coins in his pocket. So it turns out this is true because uh, it's Smith who gets the job and Smith who has 10 coins in his pocket. So it looks like the three conditions are met. Um, certainly, Smith believed that the man who will get the job had 10 coins in his pocket. It turned out to be true that the man who got the job did have 10 coins in his pocket. And Smith was justified in believing that for the reasons given, that it, you know, all signs pointed. Any reasonable person would have believed that Jones would get the job and uh, also Smith was, uh, had very good grounds for believing that Jones had 10 coins in his pocket because he'd counted them. I don't know how this happened, but he, he did. So all three criteria met, but we, uh, just about everybody uh, would agree that in this circumstance, Smith did not know that. So these are not jointly sufficient. Another case, Smith believes either Jones owns a Ford or Jones is in, in Barcelona. Now, um, this is a disjunction, and a, a disjunction is true if either disjunct is true. You don't have to have both of them to be true for it to be true, unlike a conjunction. Now, the reason Smith believes this is because um, he, so, so he does believe this, and it turns out that this is true, and he is justified in believing this because he has very strong evidence that Jones owns a Ford. Jones' evidence might be that, uh, sorry, Smith's evidence might be that Jones has at all times in the past within Smith's memory owned a car and always a Ford, and that Jones has just offered Smith a ride while driving a Ford. Let us imagine now that Smith has another friend, Brown, of whose whereabouts he is totally, oh, I'm sorry, either Jones owns a Ford or it's Brown is in Barcelona. That's embarrassing. Um, now, he doesn't think that Brown is in Barcelona. He doesn't know where Brown is. But it turns out that Brown is in Barcelona and Jones doesn't own a Ford, uh, which is surprising. It's surprising that Jones doesn't own a Ford anymore. So Smith believes this. Uh, it's true. But the reason why it's true is because of the disjunct that, uh, that Smith doesn't actually think. Uh, it's because Brown is in fact in Barcelona. That's why this is true, not because uh, Jones owns a Ford. But he's justified in believing this claim because he's justified in believing that Jones owns a Ford. So again, this is a case where uh, Smith believes this, it's true, and he's justified in believing it, but we don't want to say that he knew it. So. These are examples of Gettier cases. Gettier cases are pretty much, uh, they multiply. They're, these aren't rare ones. These aren't specifically uh, very, um, very contrived cases. It's, it's fairly easy to come up with cases like this. In fact, there's some suggestion that Bertrand Russell uh, came up with his own cases uh, a long time previously in a book of his. So that's a little bit of controversy. It's, 
it's not necessarily clear that Getje was the first person to publish on this, but certainly he did a good, good job of presenting the cases. And they have led to uh, a sort of sea change in um, epistemology, uh, in this kind of epistemology. You can, so the, the Getje problem is what's missing, what is the extra element that we need to add um, so that if you meet one, two, three, four, then you do know something. That's the debate. Or there is some suggestion that this is okay and that we can fix this and respond to Gettier cases. But certainly, Gettier presented a challenge that epistemologists then had to meet, which is why this article, short as it is, is so famous.